So once again, um, we're here talking about supporting LGBTQ plus students in the classroom specifically. Um, and for those of you that might have uh, missed it, when I introduced myself a few minutes ago, my name is Dr. Lindsay Vreeland. Y'all can call me Lindsay. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator here at CIDL at NIU. Um, but my background is in teaching gender and sexuality studies and teaching um, a lot of first year students through the writing program and working with tutors. And so I have a lot of hands-on experience with um, students, especially in classes that are small and students in classes where they get a chance to um, create connections with their instructors um, and share aspects of themselves that maybe doesn't come out in a history class. So I've had a lot of those one-on-one -on -one connections with students, which has been very val valuable and I love so much, but is also sometimes a different experience than other classes that are being taught across the university. Okay, let me turn off my little face so we can focus on the uh, PowerPoint. So today, we're going to develop some understanding of the importance of going beyond surface level support for LGBTQ plus students um, and thinking about the impact of inclusive practices on their academic success and well-being. Uh, in the description for the workshop, I mentioned that we're going to be going on beyond like thinking about pronouns and bathrooms. And I want to say that those things are very important. Um, I am in no way saying that we need to stop worrying about whether or not there is a bathroom uh, that all of our students can use in the building that we're teaching in. Um, or if it's in the building, is it on the third floor and does it take 10 minutes for them to travel to it if they need to use the restroom in the middle of class? Um, those things are things that we need to think about, that we need to advocate for our students about. Um, using correct pronouns, that's something that's super important that we want to make sure students are feeling uh, respected and seen and are being treated the way that they're um, asking us to treat them. So, so important. But there are other things that we can be doing beyond that once we're opting into the idea that yes, students deserve to be respected and yes, students deserve to be able to uh, take a bio breaks and do things for uh, their health and their bodies that are, you know, basic human needs. Um, so this is a workshop designed to explore that a little bit more. Um, so we're gonna talk about strategies to integrate LGBTQ plus perspectives into our courses, um, even in subject areas that might not explicitly cover identity related topics. Not everybody's going to be um, talking about identity in their courses um, in as obvious ways as uh, I might in my gender and sexuality courses or even in my uh, composition courses. And we're going to enhance awareness and sensitivity towards diverse experiences within the LGBTQ plus community and hopefully foster a more inclusive and affirming educational environment for all of our students. Because when we do things to help um, some of our students, everyone benefits when we are inclusive with our practices because uh, so many of our identities and our students' needs bump up into each other and overlap in interesting ways. Um, and so a good inclusive teaching practice is good for many students, not just you know students that belong into this one um, group that we are identifying in a, in a very uh, sort of casual way. Um, and uh, as I sort of uh, mentioned in these objectives, there are a diverse amount of experiences within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so while I'm going to be painting with broad strokes talking about this community, um, there is not one community, there is not one way to be uh, queer or trans, there's not one way to um, identify or demonstrate uh, your identity within this uh, wider group. 
So I do want to start with a little bit of uh, agreements. If we had more time, we could come up with agreements together, um, and that would be lovely. But um, because of the nature of us trying to uh, slosh through this in an hour, I want to make sure that we understand that we are here to, <clears throat> excuse me, learn how to support our students, not to change them. Sounds like we're all on board with that. Um, I would hope that we're all on board with that, but you never know. Um, we're here to recognize humanity. Um, and just because we don't understand something doesn't mean that we can't respect the person. Um, hopefully that is true with your students in your classes too, but that might be something um, that comes up that needs to be discussed depending on, you know, what the subject matter is and how you're talking about people. Um, and we're going to use the approaches discussed today for all students. Um, as I mentioned a little bit ago, LGBTQ plus students don't need special treatment because everybody benefits from inclusive teaching. It's the same thing with students um, who have disabilities or that are neurodiverse. Um, they have needs. They're not special needs. They're just needs. And if you are meeting their needs, you are helping other students in the class too. Okay, I also want to go over terminology really quickly. So um, LGBTQ plus is an umbrella term for the community um, that includes gender and sexual and romantic identities. The plus is in there because there are a lot of other ways um, of being and categorizing and identifying, um, including like two spirit, questioning, um, intersex identities, and so uh, that's just an umbrella term. Um, I will be using queer and trans as terms in this uh, presentation. And um, I know that they are sometimes taboo or there's negative things associated, especially with queer. Um, it's been used as a slur, um, it's been reclaimed. Um, and not everybody loves that term, but I'm going to be using it as um, an umbrella that's talking about heterosexuality as um, something that this uh, sexual and romantic identity is uh, rejecting. So um, gay, lesbian, bi, all, fun, all can uh, rest under that umbrella of queer. Um, trans is uh, discussing something being on the other side of. So that's another umbrella term that I'm going to be using. So essentially um, people who don't identify with binary gender. Um, so it might be somebody who is uh, identifying with a gender that's not the one that was assigned at birth. Um, or it might be somebody who's living in between um, genders, sees gender as a scale. Um, there's no one way to experience or identify with gender. And so we use that umbrella term of trans. And that's how I'm going to be using it today. Um, sex is particularly talking about biological characteristics, specifically talking about reproduction a lot. Um, and those conversations are uh, happening a lot right now, right? When we're talking about um, the political scape that we are in right now and talking about Roe v. Wade and talking about IVF and all of these things. Um, so sex is, specific, is specifically looking at biology and people um, within that are often uh, assigned at birth within that binary to either male or female, um, but there are intersex people that exist and there are people that um, can't reproduce, but have other biological characteristics that identify them as being uh, associated with one uh, sex over the other. And so that gets really complicated. Um, and then gender is essentially a, a cultural construct. Um, we think of it as being masculinity and femininity, um, and we'll often divide people into groups like men and women, boys and girls, uh, but 
this is again a sliding scale um, and I just want to acknowledge that things aren't always as straightforward as uh, as we would like them to be and so um, a lot of the ways that we categorize people and bodies and identities and behavior exist in a very binary way you're either this thing or you're that thing um, and so a lot of queer and trans people are actively sort of resisting that. And so um, thinking about uh, queer identities as only like being gay or being lesbian is still um, sort of playing into this binary way of thinking about gender and thinking about sexuality. Um, it's all very complicated and I, uh, think it's really, really interesting, but it's also overwhelming for people that um, are, are sort of new to these ideas and have grown up with believing um, or not even believing, but just being told about the binary. Um, and I include this little, uh, this little graphic here um, about society gender identity challenge. Um, we're not going to we're not going to play this challenge today, but I think that it's really useful to think about um, how complicated um, gender identity can be for people um, that aren't talking specifically about um, body parts, aren't talking about biology, aren't talking about um, gender in a way that you're talking about masculinity or femininity um, and how it becomes really complicated to justify and explain the way that you feel if you're working outside of this um, cisgender identity. Okay, so there's all of that, um, but I want to now get into the nitty gritty of um, of the ways that you can really demonstrate your support um, in your class. And some of you will probably be doing these things already, um, which I love. Um, so it might not be completely new information. If it is new information, that's also okay. Um, some of us are going to be newer to teaching than others. Some of us might not have had control over our classroom or over our syllabus. And so, this is an opportunity to think a little bit more critically about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So the first thing that I want to suggest doing is showing the identities matter in your syllabus and in your actions. So again, we're not specifically focusing on it only matters that you have an identity if you're queer or trans. Um, it matters that you have an identity because you're a human in this classroom, right? Um, so adding the names and pronouns of the faculty that are uh, teaching and TAs um, to your syllabus and in all communications. A lot of us already do this. We have in our um, email, our signature, um, we, uh, a lot of us are putting our, our pronouns in there um, if we're comfortable having them. Um, but this is also a great way to identify like what you actually want to be referred to. Um, and give you a chance to uh, specifically um, share what you're comfortable with and how you would uh, how you would like to be referred to, but also like demonstrate uh, that this is a, a moment of respect for you and respect for other people too, right? that you're taking this seriously um, and that you would like them to take things seriously too, which is not only your queer and trans students, right, but the other students in the classroom. Um, so, uh, for example, you might have like your regular contact information in your syllabus, but you also might have a section that says, call your instructor, Dr. F. Um, these are Dr. F's pronouns, call your teaching assistants, Tia and Mr. Alex. Um, not everybody wants to be called by their honorific. Some people uh, prefer to be called by a, a first name or a nickname, um, and that's okay. Um, identifying that information up front 
uh, creates a standard within your class and also is generally less frustrating. I have a lot of students that um, when I was teaching, didn't know what to call me, would call me um, Mrs. Rayland, would call me um, Miss Lindsay, things that they, uh, I know that were rooted in respect, um, but didn't feel right, felt icky, because I don't, I just don't like those things. Um, and so being specific in my uh, syllabus and in the ways that I uh, signed my emails, I think really, really helped students know what to call me. There was less tension over um, them maybe not even including my name in an email because they didn't know how to address me. Um, and we felt a little bit more comfortable then and they felt more comfortable disclosing information or um, specifying, actually, I'd prefer you call me um, by my middle name and not this this first name. Um, include opportunities for students to identify their name and their pronouns on sign-in sheets. For those of us that are teaching really big classes, this is probably not going to be um, the best way to have students identify whether they're attending or not. Um, I use sign-in sheets and it's not like a you get a point for attending or you uh, lose points for not attending or anything like that. It's just a way to gauge who was in the classroom, what days they missed. And then when a student says, oh, I missed last week, I can tell them exactly what days because students tend to not keep track of that for some reason. I'm not really sure why, but um, it gives me a, an idea of who's in the classroom and, and what's going on with them. Um, but this is an opportunity for students to identify the name and the pronouns that they use in class. Um, and even if they're, uh, the name that they're using is, is nothing related to their government name that you have on, um, on my NIU and in other spaces, if they use their ZID, you can identify them. Um, so give them an opportunity to, uh, to do that with you. And then you can have some sort of documentation that when you have to reach out to them, you know that you're using the name that they want you to be using. Um, and then you're not creating tensions or uh, a complicated relationship because of that. Adding a statement on names and pronouns to your syllabus is also very helpful. I think a lot of us are already doing this. Um, the GSRC and CSWGS uh, created a syllabus statement, and I think that it is already um, in the uh, syllabus, the accessible syllabus uh, that's available on CITL's website. So if you use the uh, template, I believe that this is one of the statements that's already included in the uh, in that syllabus template, but saying something along the lines of, I'm committed to use your proper name and pronouns. Um, you can share it with all the members of our learning community if you're comfortable, but also like there are options for you to change those things as you feel comfortable. There's a possibility students aren't gonna feel comfortable off the bat sharing information with others or with you that is fine. Sometimes I'll have students that want to um, try different things out and see what uh, feels good. Um, and that's okay too. So just letting them know that they don't have to have everything figured out and they don't have to be comfortable and trust everybody off the bat is really, really useful. Um, but some people don't use pronouns and they also might not be comfortable sharing their pronouns with everybody in the class. And in those cases, you just refer to them by their name, um, or they might have pronouns that are um, a nickname or whatever. And you can just sort of address that stuff as it comes. Um, honestly, in situations that uh, students ask you to use something other than uh, what we consider to be sort of like quote unquote standard pronouns, like she, um, he, they, um, as long as it's not profanity, I, you know, I generally fall in line. There's also a potential if they ask you to call them um, 
something else that you could have a conversation about that and say, are you comfortable with sharing like where this comes from? Like this is this is interesting. Um, and they can say no, and that's okay. Um, but giving students an opportunity to have that freedom is uh, is really huge and also can uh, help them feel like you care and that you're listening and that you uh, are in this together. Uh, let me see. I do have this statement, but does not include exactly how where students are able to change this information for rosters if they choose. OK. Yes, I will be sharing that information with you, too. Um, I'll be sending out the links of how um, students can change information on their Blackboard and on their rosters. Um, I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, because it's a complicated process and it doesn't change everywhere. Like there are places where you can change your name in some spaces, but it won't change for your uh, for their records um, if it's not their quote unquote like legal government name. So um, there are instances where I've had students, you know, like they're showing me a. Uh, uh, their academic records for one reason or another, um, or I had tutors that were showing me, um, you know, pay stubs, and I was like, I didn't, like, this name I didn't associate with you. I didn't realize that this was uh, a name that was associated with you at any point um, because they already went in and changed things. But, uh, but yeah, there's a whole process that of where they can change things, how they can change things, where it's going to show up. And then Blackboard is a separate process, and I will share all of that stuff with you. Um, if other things come up, by the way, while I'm uh, doing the spiel, and you think about like, oh, hey, that's great, but I don't know where that is, uh, just let me know. Um, I'm so happy to uh, share things with you or uh, do some research that might help. Um, because sometimes it doesn't occur to us that we don't know how to do something until it's stated directly. Um, something that I always, uh, again, it's inclusive teaching practice. It's not just something that helps queer and trans students, but talking about recognizing humanity, I think is such a huge aspect of teaching. Um, if we're going to be teaching in a way that we care about the individuals um, in the desks or at the computers in front of us. So when we're creating policies, we need to consider students' needs. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we don't want to begin and end with pronouns and um, bathrooms. But also, if you have late policies that don't take into account that your students might not all be able to use the restroom in your building or on the floor that you're in, um, that might not be great. <laughs> um, it, it might not be great for students with, with disabilities too that maybe um, might have to use the restroom more frequently or um, the using the restroom might be a more involved process or whatever. Um, but also not all of us can teach in buildings that have gender inclusive bathrooms and that stinks. But um, Keeping in mind that uh, if we have policies for a reason, I'm going to assume that we do, right? Um, but if there's some leeway in those situations that we can um, acknowledge, like, okay, this student um, might not be able to use the, the restroom in this building. They might not have been able to use the restroom in the building that they were before. Um, they might have to, you know, go to the... Um, go to the ground floor in the student center in order to do this, which is a couple buildings over. Like we need to keep that in mind as we're uh, creating policies, but also enforcing them, um, taking points away, creating environments where it might feel um, tense or hostile for students to come in late or just embarrassing. Um, I think that's one of the worst things is just uh, students feeling embarrassed because they have uh, needs 
that they're trying to meet and um, they're not able to do it with their class schedule and with things going on. Um, it was mentioned earlier in the chat, uh, this idea of using inclusive language. And we want to make sure that we're using inclusive language and uh, we're being inclusive in our discussions. And uh, that also might be backtracking when you say something. Um, and it's okay to interrupt yourself and say, oh, I said that incorrectly. I meant to say this other thing. Um, or acknowledging like, oh, I wrote this, you know, this assignment sheet and I said this. And I don't really think that that's what I mean to say anymore. And just acknowledging that that's part of like a human thing that you're going to make mistakes or that maybe you had um, a more narrow view of things when you were writing it that you didn't think through the pronouns that you were using or whatever. Um, and I think that's really helpful for students to know that they can make mistakes too. And to know that there's like, it's okay to uh, be continually learning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, something that I've noticed a lot is that people um, don't think that queer and trans students are in their classes if they don't like identify or aren't wearing um, like pride uh, gear, I guess. Which is interesting. And we don't have time to dissect that. <laughs> but um, we wanna make sure that we're speaking as though trans and queer students, instructors and, and staff are in every space. So we don't wanna act like if we're talking about I don't know, if we're talking about human sexuality, we don't want to act like, okay, well, we're all heterosexuals in this circumstance, and we're going to think about uh, sex or sexuality in this particular way, but also these other people think about it this way. Um, we want to make sure that we are, um, that we're being mindful of who we're including in the conversation, and it's okay to be like, this isn't my specialty, but also, you know, like we should be thinking about, you know, how this impacts uh, queer people or how this impacts trans people or whatever. Um, but we don't want to assume anything about the students that are in our classes. Um, and I mean, this, again, is a good practice and applies to students with disabilities, too. Right. If it's uh, if students have visible disabilities that can be helpful for us to recognize like, oh, I need to do this thing in order to, rec you know, like accommodate them um, to meet their needs, um, to speak to them and speak to uh, their experiences. But if students have invisible disabilities, then we might not be meeting them there too. Um, so, one of the things that I have been doing, and I'll um, you know share this information out with you all too after the um, presentation, is um, creating a, a statement of respectful discourse. So identifying that um, people are going to be coming in with differences, and part of being in college and part of learning is um, is allowing people with differences to uh, coexist and to talk and to collaborate. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to tolerate just any sort of uh, hate or um, upsetting views and values being shared in the class. So, um, where I draw the line um, in my statement is saying that we'll not be debating uh, the right of anybody to exist or have rights based off of gender, sexuality, race, ability, nationality, or other identity. Um, and then I give students an opportunity to come and talk with me one on one if they want to know more information about something or if they have a hot take that they just really think that they need to get out. Um, this statement has been very useful when um talking with cis students about uh trans identities but it's also been very useful when talking about um 
immigration status and an undocumented uh, people in the United and the United States when talking about uh, or with when talking with students who are naturalized citizens. So again, it's a good practice that hits a lot of the things that we need to. It gives students an opportunity that if they want to have a conversation, they want to learn more. Um, if they feel like they're confused, then they can do that with me one on one and they don't have to um, talk about identities in a way that is uh, dehumanizing to other people in the classroom and might make them feel like they are um, test subjects or uh, something to uh, be, you know, talked about, but not in a person to be engaged with. Um, or that they have to stand up for everybody who has their identity or, you know, disclose information either. Um, thinking a little bit more about inclusive language, um, some of the policies that are pretty standard for uh, gender and sexuality studies, but also um, are becoming more and more popular within the world of like writing and English is talking about um, using inclusive language and pronouns um, when it comes to people that we don't know. Um, so are we um, assuming somebody's gender based off of their name? Um, is it more appropriate to use they, them, if we don't know um, who this person is? Should we be using um, their honorifics and referring to them as, you know, uh, Dr. Vreeland, instead of assuming um, parts about their identity and attaching a, a miss or a missus or a ma'am to, uh, to Vreeland? Um, so I have a statement that talks about uh, using the singular they and how it's grammatically correct. Um, there's always going to be somebody who is uh, pushing back on that, at least in the English world. Um, and I also give the students opportunities to, or examples of language that they could use instead of saying um, man, woman, Mr. Ma'am, whatever that is. Um, so talking about people or addressing people, saying individual, person, people, friend, comrade, um, saying y'all instead of you guys, um, referring to people as everyone, team, folks, scholars, all of those things are uh, things that students can refer to their uh, um their peers as or people that they don't know, um, but also ways that we can refer to the classroom also. Um, saying hi friends instead of saying um, hi guys is maybe something that takes a little bit of time to uh, practice and to get into um, the hang of, but can be, um, can be helpful for students that are maybe um, a little bit sensitive to the uh, group being referred to as guys. Um, I know that's a very Midwestern thing, and I know that a lot of people feel like that's a very gender neutral thing to say guys, but um, we know that it does, uh, it does become a sticking point with some students and will, um, Get them to shut down sometimes. So uh, thinking about our our language in that way. And again, you might say something and then want to backtrack and say, oh, I actually meant this thing instead. And I think that that is uh, very useful, very normal and uh, and great model for for students to let them know that they can make those mistakes. They can backtrack on them. It's not a big deal to be wrong. Um, what's important is this idea that you're going to be moving forward um, and trying to improve. When you are talking about people, we want to be as specific as possible. So um, are you actually talking about women? Are you talking about females? Are you talking about people with XX chromosome? Are you talking about people who can give birth? There are different meanings to all of those things. Um, 
And so, again, we see a lot of people talking about, well, women are treated this way or this is only relevant to women. But are we actually talking about people who can give birth, um, which is different than just women? Um, so if we can be as specific as possible, that's very, very helpful. Um, I've had some friends in uh, chemistry and biology say that that's very confusing and that's hard sometimes. And I totally understand. Um, but it's a good practice with, uh, with, for you and for your students to think about, like, what are you actually talking about here? Are you talking about a gender identity? Are you talking about um, biology? Are you talking about chromosomes? Because that's different than um, secondary sex characteristics. So um, the more specific we can be, the more clear that we can be, even if it's a little bit challenging um, to get there sometimes. And we also wanna create expectations and boundaries for the group work that we're doing to make sure that we are creating environments where our students can feel safe. Um, so LGBTQ plus students often worry about working with other people that are gonna be unsupportive, that are going to, um, that they might meet with outside of class and might make them feel vulnerable or, um, uncomfortable with uh, that they have to give their cell phone numbers to you or even connect with through uh, social media and they might feel really vulnerable and um, and and not protected in those ways. So we want to make sure that we are um, thinking about all of that stuff when we are asking our students to work together. So are we creating environments where they can go and work and they're not going to be in somebody's uh, physical space? Um, are we making sure that they can connect in ways that they aren't uh, giving out a lot of personal information? Um, what are we doing in order to uh, support them if we feel like um, group work is a necessary thing? And I do think that group work is necessary and I do think that collaboration is necessary, but um, we want to make sure that we're being mindful um, and we're uh, creating expectations for how that works and where that should be and um, that it's okay for students to um, have boundaries with all of that. Um, so one of the things I recommend for that is, is creating a document with your students that outlines, you know, how students are going to be treated and what the expectations are, what that looks like. Um, okay, I see Jacqueline put something in the chat. Often target marketing demographics are broken down by men and women, yes. Um, we're just seeing more prominent market research that's more inclusive. Any suggestions on how to address this in class? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's exactly it. We've been working within this, this sort of um, binary system for a very long time, we've been collecting data in a binary system too, right? Where um, a lot of the research that we've been doing breaks down like, well, this is how women feel about their bodies versus this is how men feel about their bodies. This is how women are portrayed in ads versus this is how men are portrayed in ads, that sort of thing. And so I think that just being upfront with that um, and saying, okay, well, this research is done and it's broken down in this way. And this isn't the most helpful, but this is what we have. Um, I think that that's okay. I think that not having all the answers is totally fine and recognizing that the system is wonky and weird and confusing and sometimes gross is okay. We don't have to have necessarily answers to that, but, um, but I think that acknowledging those demographics and acknowledging like, hey, we're moving past this finally. So sometimes the language in the readings that we're doing aren't gonna match the things that we're thinking about. And sometimes, you know, the language that you use um, as an instructor or that students use might not match exactly what the meaning is. And it's okay to hit pause and say, okay, you said females do this. What do you mean? Are you talking about gender? Are you talking about these other things? I think that this is what you mean by this. Um, 
and that that's not um that's thinking critically about what we're saying and what we mean not being critical of a particular person that is saying these things because it takes time to retrain ourselves to uh sit down and reflect and think about these things Thank you for coming. I'll be sending along the full uh, uh, presentation recording too. So I'm glad that um, you're able to join with us for this amount of time. Um, so there are a few other things that I want to get to. We're running out of time and um, I appreciate you all uh, hanging in there with me. Um, but I want to talk briefly about integrating um, queer and trans perspectives. So um, some of our classes aren't going to be talking specifically about identity, but there are opportunities for us to uh, include um, adaptations or primary or secondary sources that are thinking about uh, queer and trans identities that use a queer theoretical approach when talking about um, the materials that we're looking at um, that uh, discuss current news or historical events that uh, involve what we're talking about in class and queer and trans identities too. Um, you might have people that are queer or trans come in class and actually talk to your students if you're talking about um, social media marketing, you might find somebody who can come in and talk about that. Um, it might be not easy to get a person into your class to uh, be a guest speaker just in general. Um, sometimes that's really difficult to arrange. So maybe you have something that is virtual or pre-recorded, or even you can find YouTube videos that are uh, queer and trans people talking about, okay, what does this look like in um, being a a trans researcher in um, the field of uh, plant biology. Um, and you also can just be interrogating uh, stereotypes and expectations, thinking about, okay, who, what do we think about when we think about somebody in this field? Um, is the default somebody that is cisgender or heterosexual? A lot of our fields have the default of somebody who is middle-aged white man. Um, and so that's worth interrogating too. What do we expect to see from somebody in this field? Um, and how are we uh, able to start thinking critically about that and work against those expectations? Okay, so We've got seven minutes left, and I want to give you all a chance to uh, ask questions if you have them. But I'm also curious, what are some ways that you've uh, supported LGBT youth plus students or that you've experienced other people supporting them? Um, and what are some challenges that you've uh, faced in, uh, in your field at NIU or in academia in general? Thanks, Rachel. While y'all are typing um, to fill the quiet, I hate I hate that I do this, but I I do it still. Um, I think that one of the things that I've heard a lot from students is this idea of being the token queer person or the token trans person in the classroom, and so that's something that we really need to be sort of mindful of: is not creating an environment where this one person is talking for a community. Um, or that they are supposed to know everything within the community or that they have particular um, political leanings or ideas or behaviors because of that. 
Um, so uh, that's something to just sort of like be mindful as we uh, are navigating these things. If people aren't actively sharing um, information, but you they've disclosed that, you know, these aspects of their identities, but they aren't like actively sharing things when you're talking about, um, you know, like uh, gay marriage or something like that, then let's not pick on them. Let's not expect them to, to play that role of uh, being the person to talk to everybody. <laughs> too much to type. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions after this too. Um, if it, if it feels like it's too much to type, you can, you can type after this too. Um, one of the challenges supports I've experienced is as a librarian, we help people look for information. Yeah. Um, support students by acknowledging the community is not homogenous and diverse. Love that. Also by challenging, but also challenging because sometimes I end up advising students to use really long search strings or terms that they might not identify with to search for a topic. Not sure if I'm capturing this at all. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's um, that's a clear challenge, and I think that there's not one easy way to sort of like make that better. But I think that it's good to, for students to start from somewhere, right? Um, and know that there are resources and there's language out there that might not. Um, be the perfect language for them or whatever, but there's there's stuff and there's things to explore and that there's, um, it's this really interesting world that is not just like you said, not, not homogenous, not um, the space that is immovable. It stretches and it breaks off and it goes in interesting um, ways and that there's not uh, this one destination for uh, somebody if you're going to be queer or if you're going to be trans, um, if you're going to be. See, I need to back, I need to backtrack on that. If you are queer, if you are trans, um, if you are public with that, there's not one way to be those things. Um, sitting up front, I'm learning, I want to learn, yeah. Yeah, um, referring to uh, especially um, younger people as girls and boys, I can understand that that's like a, um, that can be a big point of, of tension. And it's one of those things that's probably been so ingrained for so long. So to stop doing it is not that big of a deal, probably. Um, that you can you can change that behavior, that you can correct yourself when it comes up, but it's probably something that you just didn't think about critically before. And that's okay. Like we can't know everything all the time. We can't have, anticipate all of the issues that we're going to face. Um, so I love having that open mind that like, okay, I can do better. We can talk about students. We can say kids. Um, we can say our young scholars or whatever, you know, fun way that we want to refer to our students um, in that first grade classroom and said, first graders, all of those things are fine, but um, there might be, um, there might be a growth period for sure. Yeah, I think that there's uh, definitely this fear of doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing and being wrong, especially in academia, we don't want to be wrong. Right. We're the people that are supposed to know all the stuff and we're supposed to be, you know, teaching other people. And so it's hard being wrong in general as a person, but also very hard being wrong as a teacher. I need to wrap this up and finish the uh, recording, but I'm so happy to further have this conversation if we need to have it. Um, so I just want to say thank you for for joining. Um, and I'm so glad that we had this uh, really great discussion. And I hope that we continue to have these more, these con conversations because they're really, really.
Thank you.